Dr. Thomas Bruns uh, uh, to talk about mycorrhizae fungi, fungi and how they interact with our native plants. Uh, he has uh, been a professor uh, at, at Berkeley for many years. He's emeritus professor in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology at UC Berkeley. Uh, and his specialty uh, is an area of, of uh, in mycorrhizae. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about, in the Native Plant Society, plant communities. Uh, but we often, th we typically think less about those communities of mycorrhizae and other organisms that are under the surface, which are extremely complex and rich. And that is the area uh, that, uh, he's going to talk about tonight, uh, and it's, uh, it's one that's very important to native, native plants and all plants. Uh, he's, uh, he's a national and internationally recognized expert in this field. Uh, he served as president of the Mycological Society of America uh, and president of the International Mycorrhiza Society and received the Distinguished Mycologist Award in 2018 from the Mycological Society of America for his career achievements in the field. So uh, we are, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, Dr. Tom Bruns and your presentation. So Tom, it's all yours. Thanks very much. Okay, let's see if I can get this going here. All right. Can everybody see that? <laughs> and of course, everybody's muted, so I don't know. <laughs> the answer is yes. Good. Let's see. Now I got to move this bar over so it doesn't. All right. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about mycorrhizae tonight. And what I'm going to do is give you a tour through the major types of mycorrhizae and relate those back to, to the plants. Um, and in some ways, this is kind of bait and switch in that in that I said, okay, I'm gonna talk about how they interact with the native plants. The truth is in most cases, we don't really know how they interact with the native plants. There's an awful lot we don't know about, about interactions. So um, what, what we do know is sort of how they generally interact with plants and, and some particular plants that have been studied. And so I'll relate it back in that way. And then when it gets to question time, if I can answer your specific questions on on some of these interactions, I will. Okay, so with that introduction, let's see if I can forward this, yes. Okay, <clears throat> so there's four main types of mycorrhizae uh, that, that uh, occur. There's the ectomycorrhizae, which I'll end up talking about first, and it's the group that I've spent most of my career working on, so it's going to get more time. <laughs> Uh, there's the arbuscular mycorrhizae, which is actually the most common type of mycorrhizae um, and is widespread in a lot of the herbs and so on. And then there's two, two uh, less common types of mycorrhizae that are specific to, to particular plant families, namely the ericaceae and the, and the orchid family. Okay, so we'll start with ectos. And if... Um, uh, what I'm what I'm showing here is a little cartoon of what's going on with with this interaction, and really this is going to be quite similar in in the other four types. In that you'll have a plant somewhere on the roots of the plant, there's going to be an association with a with a fungus, an intimate one that tangles up with the with the plant cells. At that point, there's going to be an exchange of sugars or carbohydrates, as the diagram shows here. Uh, that will be supplied by the plant and given to the fungus. And in return, the fungus is going to find nutrients, mostly in the soil, and pass them on to the, to the um, plant. And so this interaction is very, very widespread, uh, the mycorrhizal interaction overall, that something like 95% of all plant species are mycorrhizal. So, so usually plants are mycorrhizal. But, they, but typically plants are mycorrhizal in a specific way, one of those four that I mentioned at the beginning, and 
and can't do more than one. There's there's a few that do more than one, but uh, I'm going to simplify it and say they all I'll do one or the other. So in the case of the ectos, which is what we're working on now, the main thing that's uh, different. Uh, oh, so okay, so here's the uh, mycelium. So why is the mycelium better than plant roots? Why don't the plants just get their own nutrients and not pay the fungus? Um, and the reason is that fungal mycelium is much finer. So it can get into little parts of the soil that a root couldn't because it's, it's orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, it has a much higher surface to volume ratio. And so that means that uh, there's a lot of absorbing surface in the mycelium, the, the hyphae here of the fungi, uh, more, more per unit volume than there would be for even a very small fine plant root. Uh, and so that makes them very good at absorbing things out of the soil. And then uh, some of the fungi have additional enzymes that they can retrieve nutrients uh, with those that, that the plant could not retrieve because they don't have that same set of enzymes in their roots. And that will be particularly true of this first group. I'm going to talk about the ectos. Okay, so turning to what they, which uh, plants are associated with ectos. Uh, plant hosts are mostly uh, found in temperate forest trees. And so in our area, they'd be things like pine and Douglas fir and true fir and oaks and manzanita and madrone. Those would be some of our, our main mycorrhizal hosts. Uh, and so going back to this diagram, this is the, one of the big differences from the other groups that we're going to talk about in that usually the host for an ectomycorrhizal uh, interaction is a large tree and a large tree of a particular group. So interestingly, only 2% of plant species on the planet uh, are involved with ectomycorrhizae. So it sounds like a really, really minor type of mycorrhizae. Who cares, you know? But uh, it turns out that, six, that, that those 2% of the plant species account for 60% of the tree stems by, uh, by basal area. So in other words, a lot of the big forests are dominated by ectomycorrhizae. And if we look at that on a global scale, uh, this little color coding here shows that the uh, that up in the northern hemisphere, especially the boreal forest, very densely ectomycorrhizal. As you come south, uh, you get a lower percentage of ectomycorrhizae, but still uh, pretty dominant in the uh, in the temperate zones. By the time you get to the tropics, uh, ecto becomes um, less common that a lot of the plants down there are, are of a different type of mycorrhizae that uh, are muscular that we'll come back to. So there's a patterning on the globe as to where these occur, but we're in this zone. So we're in a hot red zone. A lot of our, all of our forests uh, are, are uh, ecto. So, <clears throat> so the typical hosts worldwide are everything in the phagales. The whole order phagales is ectomycorrhizal. Is that shows why that map was so red in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the entire Pinaceae is ectomycorrhizal. And in fact, the Pinaceae are, are very, very dependent on, on this interaction that you cannot grow pine without these fungi. Um, and that was actually not discovered until the experiment was inadvertently done that people move pine to um, actually Puerto Rico where there weren't native pines and they wouldn't grow until they brought in mycorrhizae. And the same thing occurred in the Southern hemisphere, but, but uh, was not seen when pines were brought in as potted plants. It's only seen when you bring them in as seed because if they come in as potted plants, they're already colonized. So in any case, they're, they're really, really dependent. You basically can't grow a pine tree or anything in the Pinaceae without, um, ectomycorrhizae, and that would be true of, of oaks and chestnuts and things in the phagales largely too. Eucalyptus and many other members of the Myrtaceae are ecto. 
uh, also the Kazurine ACE. So, so uh, if we went back to that map, you'd see that uh, Australia is lit up, at least on the coast, with ecto. The Diptrocarp ACE in Borneo and Malaysia are all ectomycorrhizae. And then there's uh, many tropical legumes, things like Dasambi and a few others uh, are, are ecto. And then there are some shrubs that are ectomycorrhizal. Uh, so in our area, uh, Arctostaphylus is one that's ectomycorrhizal. And uh, if we get to the uh, ericoid mycorrhizae, you'd, you might expect those to be ericoid mycorrhizae, but they're not. They've given up on that and they've learned to be ecto instead, uh, along with Arbutus. Um, and then um, one of our introduced ornamental plants, Cystus, is, a, is ectomycorrhizal. Uh, and then salix is one that can actually do ecto and other things, but when you get into uh, alpine zones, for example, it's usually it's usually fairly ecto. Okay, so we saw the plants. Let's turn to the fungi. Who are the fungi involved with ectomycorrhizae? There are a lot of fungi that do this. Uh, the estimates are somewhere around ten thousand species, uh, and they occur in the in in the Basidiomycota, which are the mushroom formers, the Ascomycota, uh, and even uh, there's a couple in the Mucoromycota, a, a lower mold group. Um, and so going back to this diagram, we think of, of these as, as fungi that would form big mushrooms. And uh, that can certainly be true. So this is, this is our uh, iconic Boletus edulis. Um, in an oversized version of it from Point Reyes. Um, and uh, this would be an example of a fruit body from an ectomycorrhizal mushroom. And the th thing to think about when you see a mushroom this size is that it, it got that big because it's basically plugged into to a large host and getting lots and lots of sugars from it. That's, that's why it gets this big. And so a lot of our Great big mushrooms. If you go, if you walk in any pine forest and see a big mushroom, chances are very high that that is an ectomycorrhizal species. There are some saprobes that get big too, but mostly uh, the really big mushrooms in our forests are the are the ectomycorrhizal fungi. However, um, there are also lots of small things that are ectomycorrhizal. These are crust fungi. Uh, also related to the mushroom formers of Basidiomycota, uh, but they just make a little crust of, of spores, usually on woody debris and so on. And they're not decaying the wood here, but they use it just, just as a support. And so you can flip these over on a, if you're walking around a forest and find these, and they're just covered with spores and they too are, are ectomycorrhizal. The diversity of these things in forests is very, very high. So this is a um, what's called a ranked abundance curve. So what you're looking at essentially, to simplify it, I'll say it's biomass. It's not quite biomass, but but we'll call it that. Uh, and each and it's, it's ranked by the species with the most biomass here to the species with the least biomass over at the far end. So it's just a, a ranked abundance curve. And what you can see here, this was taken from a, a Abies concolor forest uh, just behind Fresno. And uh, from about a two hectare area. And the, it takes the first 29 species to account for 50% of the biomass. But that's just a, that's just a subset of this whole larger ranked abundance curve that goes out to over a hundred species. And so here's this forest that's that's amazingly boring above ground that there's you know maybe five tree species. Um, but below ground it's like the tropics. It's hyper diverse with with uh, lots and lots of, of uh, ectomycorrhizal fungal species. So right away that tells you something about the specificity is that there's uh, each of these trees can be associated with lots of different fungi. It isn't a one-to-one -one interaction where a single tree has one uh, species it can associate with. One tree can associate with hundreds of different sp 
species or even thousands if you go over the whole range of that species. We know a little bit about the evolution of this and what we know is that uh, the fungi that eventually became ectomycorrhizal uh, evolved before their hosts. And when the hosts evolved, then the, then the fungi diversified and independently learned how to be ectomycorrhizal multiple times. So it's a highly convergent uh, association. Um, and the current estimates are that ectomycorrhizal symbiosis evolves 60 to 80 times with the fungi. So, it's, so it looks, as we go through it and I show you how complex it looks, it seems incredible that, that they would be able to uh, learn how to do this independently multiple times, but that appears to be what, what happened. Uh, and so their ancestors, the ancestors of the fungi were saprobes. They were things that could decay uh, dead material. Um, but as they became ectomycorrhizal, we know that they lost most of that ability. Most of these fungi now can no longer grow uh, independently um, without their host. Once you pull them away from the host, uh, they die. And uh, even in a Petri dish, if you, if you cut out a little piece and put it, give it a cushy existence, there's just a very small subset of these that we can grow in culture. Most of them won't grow. So when they became mycorrhizal, they did it convergently and they've, and they've lost a lot of uh, enzymatic ability when they did that and the ability to live independently. Okay, so <clears throat> we've talked about the plants involved. We've talked about the fungi involved. Let's talk about the cost. The cost of this interaction for the plant, the estimates vary widely, but, um, but kind of a safe bottom of this is about 20% of the net photosynthate of these large trees goes to their fungi. So that's a big tax. I mean, that's, that's basically what we, what we pay in federal tax or probably most of us pay a little more than that now, but, but uh, it's, it's a huge amount of the, of the net primary productivity of these trees goes to the fungi. And the reason that is valuable to these is simply that they cannot grow in the areas where they grow with, without these fungi. And it's primarily because, the, as I'll show you, the nutrients in these systems are tied up in ways that the, that the trees can't get at them unless the fungi uh, help them. So <clears throat> just to, to uh, come back to the cost of this and the, and the flow of Carbon, I want to show you some work by uh, Leek and Reed's uh, group in Sheffield, England. They have these really neat microcosms where they can grow a little plant. This is a little birch tree uh, and they label it with uh, radioactive uh, uh, C14. And then uh, they can watch the pulse of that radioactivity in real time and see where it goes. And what you're seeing here is that uh, this fringe is not root, but it's all the mycelium from the ectomycorrhizal fungi. So it's the fungal front that's expanding in, into here. In less than 24 hours after they've labeled that, almost all of the label is right at the front of that expanding um, mycelial uh, edge here. So, so on these little trees, they get a lot of the carbon. Okay, did I go backwards or forward here? No, I went back, all right. Okay, so what are they using that for? What, what are they, they're finding nutrients, but the, the big trick with ectos is not that they can take, is not that they find mobile nutrients, things that the plants could get themselves, but they are mobilizing nutrients that the plants could not get. And what they're basically doing is using what's left of their en enzymology to uh, retrieve nitrogen out of, out of um, biomass that's incorporated in the soil. Um, so when I think of an ecto system, I think of a system like this, where there's just this big pile of organic detritus on top of some very poor soil underneath. That's kind of a cl classic ectomycorrhizal forest soil. 
And, and so what this fungus is doing here is it's getting its mycelium into this partly digested um, duff material here. And that is where it's getting the nitrogen that allows, allows it to pass it on to the tree and get carbon for it. And they're doing this because they have a, a repertoire of enzymes that the plant does it. They have lots of cellulases, they have peroxidases that uh, help break down the lignin and lacases. Uh, and, and from this, they can retrieve any nutrients that are tied up in this, in this organic biomass. But it's really nitrogen that limits these systems mostly. So, so um, adding, uh, having these in there allows these plants to grow because now they're not nitrogen starved. Um, and I, sh I should mention that, that ectomycorrhizae are pretty sensitive to fertilization for this reason. In, in situations where there's a lot of uh, nitrogen input from the atmosphere, for example, like LA basin and so on, it can, it can actually suppress the mycorrhizae or at least change the content of the, of the mycorrhizal community uh, because th these fungi are only a deal for the, for the plant if nitrogen is limiting. When nitrogen is no longer limiting, uh, then many of the uh, plants will sort of shed the most expensive of their uh, associates. And this, this was seen first in, in uh, Europe where, where uh, nitrogen inputs were quite high in the Netherlands in particular. Okay, so coming back to this organic detritus and so on, you can see this in a, in a lab situation. This is again, this group from Sheffield, England. And this is again, a little microcosm with a, with a, a birch seedling. And this is the, the uh, mycorrhizal fungus uh, Paxillus involutus here. What they've done is they've given it a little uh, cafeteria test where they've given uh, trays of different organic detritus here. And then they watch where the um, Paxillus colonizes. So you can see it really likes this particular tray. Uh, maybe like this one a little less. And, uh, and they could label that and show that, that uh, the plant is ret retrieving nutrients out of these from the fungus. And it turns out ectos not only are after organic detritus, but they can go for, for uh, inorganic minerals directly out of bedrock. Uh, and this was work that, that um, done, was done by Anna Rosling in Sweden. And she's also doing this sort of cafeteria test in a, in a microcosm here and giving it different rock types. And you can see that uh, when it hits the felspar, it, it proliferates a lot of hyphae in there and, and goes nuts. It likes that. It's because felspar, uh, when it's broken down, releases potassium. So they can get they can pull potassium out of rock. And uh, at the electron uh, uh, scanning electron microscope level, you can see that rock gets etched by these hyphae. So here's a fungal hypha here. And you, you can see that there's this little groove where the, where the hypha had been sitting. And it may, can also make boreholes through it. And when you have highly weathered rock, when you look at, whoops, ah. trying to go back. All right, highly weathered rock. Um, you can see that it's, it's just cut, a honeycomb of these little areas that have been cut into by these hyphae. Um, so the, so ectomycorrhizae are also important for weathering because of, because of this. Okay, so where do we get these? How do they find new roots? That's what inoculum is. It's in other words, when, when um, uh, you have an uncolonized root, how does a fungus find that uncolonized root? The simplest way is that it can grow from one living root to another. So in a forest situation where you've got a colonized tree, uh, if you have an uncolonized new root that pops out, chances are that hyphae will grow from, from one colonized root to the uncolonized root and colonize it. And that's a very efficient method uh, to do it. And, and as a result, most roots in a forest situation become colonized. Uh, 
They can also be colonized by spores, uh, sexual spores that are produced from those mushrooms or mushroom-like uh, structures that get formed. And so these can disperse by air. Uh, and that kind of dispersal is, is uh, way less efficient. Um, in fact, it's so inefficient that for some species, uh, it's a rare event that spores often don't work very well for, for many ectomycorrhizal species, but there are some that, that are very good at getting in by spore. Uh, and so if, if a tree is maybe a kilometer away from a, a forest setting, chances are it will be colonized by windborne spores. And then there's also a, a type of spore that's formed within the soil uh, that is a uh, mitotic spore called the sclerotium. And those can uh, wait out long periods of time in the soil and, and react. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll show you at least the mycelial end. So this is a, this is a pine tree. This is the genus Suillus growing out from it. And you can see that the hyphae is way more extensive than the roots of the, of the pine tree. Um, and this little tiny tree is supporting this huge mycelial mat. Uh, so if another pine tree came down near that, the chances are that it would be colonized by this expanding web. And again, that's the most effective inoculant. Okay, so small sexual spores were the, were the biggie. Uh, oh, and I th think I was supposed to say here that um, uh, that even when we have uh, large amounts of these, let's say you collect spores out of a mushroom and you pour them onto an uncolonized seedling by the millions, it almost never colonizes that, that seedling. There's only a very few species where the spores are very effective at colonizing. Okay, so what do these things look like? So this diagram kind of shows you what they look like. They usually, the roots look a little swollen. This is a, this is a fine root that would be a millimeter or two in size. Um, they have a wrapper of fun, fungus around it called a mantle. And then between the, uh, uh, the hyphae of the fungi go right in between the cells of the, of the, of the uh, root tip there, but they don't penetrate the root, root cells. So here's what one of these little um, mycorrhizal root tips would look like. In this case, it's highly branched. Uh, this whole thing would just be a millimeter or two across. So very this, the finest roots here. Uh, it's all white because it's wrapped by the white mycelium of the fungus. Um, if you go digging in the soil and spread these out under a scope, you'll see lots and lots of different ones because again, the um, the diversity of these things is really, really high. Uh, and so, you know, a single soil core might yield uh, somewhere between uh, four to a dozen different species. And then as you go across the whole hectare, you'd be on that ranked abundance curve that I showed you earlier with hundreds. Now those root tips, if you if you cut them in sections, so this is supposed to be a root tip looking down here. This wrapper around here is is the mantle, and you can see the little hyphae going between the the outer root cells here, but not in them. That that would be the Hartig net. And here it is in cross section, showing the same thing. So here's that wrapper of fungus around there. That's the mantle, and then here's the Hartig net. So the mantle actually completely covers the outside of that root. So the root has no soil contact at all directly. It couldn't, it couldn't get any nutrients except through the fungus. And then the, the fungus is delivering those nutrients uh, at this interface between the, the cell uh, and the hyphae in the Hartig net area. And this is a way that could look in a greenhouse sort of setting. So here's a little pine seedling. This is a genus Lacaria. Um, these are mycorrhizal roots. If you blow one of them up, you can see the little fuzz that's the hyphae around it. And then if you cut it in, in section here, this outer wrapper is the, uh, uh, the mantle. Uh, 
Okay, so so far we've been talking about this as a, a sort of a one-to-many interaction where a plant would be colonized by lots of different mycorrhizal fungi around in its root system and setting up this trade with with them carbohydrates for nutrients. Uh, the fungus would be doing the same thing as if the fungus is associated with that plant, but it might grow out and and associate with the plant next to it or the plant next to that. And so there's a lot of um, uh, non-specific interactions here, although it, it, it could be specific because maybe all the trees are of the same species, but many different fungi would be involved in any case. That ends up being different when we get to what I would call mycorrhizal parasites. These plants that are non-photosynthetic, uh, and so they have no carbon to give the the fungus, no sugars to give the car, uh, the fungus, but yet they're mycorrhizal. And, and uh, this first example oops, that I'm showing you is the, is the genus Trospera pine drops, which I'm guessing most of you have seen if you've been up in the Sierras, very common in sort of mid altitude Sierras, especially in lodgepole pine forest, loves lodgepole, but also uh, uh, ponderosa pine. And if you dig up this plant, what you'd find is a dense root ball. All of those roots on the root ball would be densely mycorrhizal. And uh, that same fungus then would go off and form mycorrhizal root tips with the pine tree next to it. So that is why you always find these under pine, is that it's plugged into the pine mycorrhizae and sponging off them. But more than that, it's, it's plugging into just one of the many mycorrhizae that are associated with this pine. It's plugging into uh, to a genus called Rhizopogon, which is a little false truffle sort of thing. And it turns out that if you look at all of the monotropoidae, they all do the same thing, but with different fungi. They each have a specific fungal associate, but they all picked a different one. So, for example, the trosper that I just showed you is always associated with Rhizopogon celebrosus or Arctostaphylus or something in those groups. Uh, snow plant is always associated with Rhizopogon elleni. Pleurocospora is associated with Gaudiaria. Monotropa with Rushula, uh, Brevipes. Interestingly, only in the west, if you get to the east and look at Uniflora, it has a broader uh, range of fungi it associates with, et cetera, et cetera. And so each of these has a very specific association. So in terms of our native plants, here is one example I could point out where we know quite a bit about their mycorrhizal interaction and, and it's highly specific, uh, but it's only with these mycorrhizal parasites that that appears to be true. The last one on the list I just wanted to point out because hematomies is a pretty rare plant. Uh, not a, not a common one to find. And I suspect that the reason it's a rare plant is it's picked a very rare fungus for its host. Uh, hidden elum, which is, is what it's always associated with, is not a common fungus. Um, and is tends to be sort of an old growth forest uh, associate. Some of the non-photosynthetic orchids are also associated with specific ectomycorrhizal fungi. So they're doing the same things that the monotropes do. And in this case, they've given up their normal normal orchid mycorrhizae to hook into ectomycorrhizal uh, networks. Um, and so the, the coral root fungi, for example, which are common in our area, uh, are highly specific. One uh, maculate is always with the Russellaceae. Uh, Trifida is always with uh, Thelephora tomentella, and uh, Cephalanthrus is, is another one that's always with Thelephora tomentella. And I sh should mention that a lot of the terrestrial orchids that are photosynthetic are also associated with uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. Okay, so <clears throat> let me stop for a moment and I will answer any questions on ectos before I go on to the next group. Uh, and let's see, I'll look in the chat to see if. Uh, let's see, Ammonita phylloides, yes, is a, is a non, 
uh, non-native invasives. Uh, okay. Oh, you somebody's been answering questions. I see. Please also include common names of families, species, and okay. I'll try to do that. To the to the extent there are common names for the fungi, many of them are right. Are there extreme environments where these fungi are not around? Um, <clears throat> so mostly there are environments where they've never been around because that type of forest isn't there. So for example, Southern Hemisphere, when pine was moved there, uh, ectomycorrhizae were not in the air, that area that were compatible with pine. And so initially uh, pine did not do well in the Southern Hemisphere, but once the fungi got there, they now become invasive as a result of them. The other kinds of extreme settings where you might not get these uh, would be um, uh, strip mines or, or areas where something really severe has happened to the, to the uh, soil. Uh, fire would not be severe enough. Um, mycorrhizae do, do fine with fire. You, uh, it sets them back and changes the community structure, but but you still have lots of uh, compatible micro ectomycorrhizae after fire. Uh, same with logging. Logging is not an extreme enough setting, but if you have something really extreme, or if you change from cover type, let's say you go from uh, prairie to forest, um, the prairie soil would not have ectomycorrhizae mycorrhizal inoculum initially, and it would take some time before it got back in there. When we see white roots, is that the, is that the mycorrhizal sheath? In some cases it might be, but only if the roots look uh, sort of swollen and often forked. Uh, do introduced earthworms break, break down the duff uh, compete with ectomycorrhizae or maybe enhance the uh, ectomycorrhizal dispersal. I know somebody who's been looking at the earthworm dispersal and it does look like they move things around in the soil that if there's if there's like a patchy inoculum of, of mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizal spores, the earthworms can kind of spread that around and make it more available. In terms of competing with them, um, they probably don't because the Introduced earthworms are in more fertile soil generally than ectomycorrhizal hosts are usually in. Um, so I think you see the earthworm invasion, at least the one I know in the east, is primarily in things like uh, sugar maple and non ectomycorrhizal hosts, which we'll get to in a moment. I'm going to do one more question. I'm going to go back to my, uh, the rest of this. Does extreme heat of firestorm kill off a uh, fungal colony? Um, mostly it's the, it's the death of the tree that kills off the fungal uh, colony, that when the tree dies, the fungi die. Uh, and so most of the ectomycorrhizal community dies in the fire, but there are some that have resistant spores and, and the spores are reactive enough that they, that they serve as inoculum. And so usually when there's a fire, what happens is you change the community structure of, of the mycorrhizal community, but you still have uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi available. Okay, so I'm going to go back. Whoops. And I'm back now, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's go on to this. So we'll go to the next mycorrhizal group. These are the arbuscular mycorrhizae. And the arbuscular mycorrhizae really are the ones that I should talk about exclusively because they're, they're the ones that are the most common uh, in that 80% of vascular plants are associated with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So this would include um, most of the herbs, shrubs, even most of the trees. Uh, even hornworts and liverworts are associated with them. Um, the plant dependency here varies a lot in that I would say most plants that are associated with AM fungi can live without them if you fertilize them and do well. Uh, and usually the inoculum of, of AM fungi is common enough that they will eventually get inoculated and, 
and start to grow. So usually it's not a limiting factor, but I think uh, in many cases, we, we don't really know the details of how many plants interact with these. All right. So um, if we go back to this diagram and we're still looking at the ecto one, but I've just boxed off the parts that are common with AM or our buscular mycorrhizae. So they still do this trade of sugars for nutrients. They still have mycelium going out in the soil, but they can't mobilize nutrients like the ecto did. They don't have the enzymology to break down litter, for example, and, and retrieve nutrients from it. And they don't make big mushrooms and they don't do anything to the roots that looks uh, visually different from the outside. This is what they do. <laughs> so this, this is a, a microscopic image of cleared root cells in this little broccoli-like structure is, is what's called an arbuscle. And what an arbuscle is, is basically an infection structure where the fungus has, has penetrated the cell wall of the root and pushed into the, the cell, but without breaking the cell membrane. So it's like you sticking your finger in a balloon. Uh, it looks like your finger's in the balloon from the side, but really the balloon is still wrapped around your finger. And it's the same thing here is that this hyphae is highly branched, but the, the cell membrane is still wrapped around it. So it gives a, a huge interface where cell membrane of plant and, and membrane of, of fungus interact with each other. These little structures uh, only last about two weeks and then the plant dissolves them. And the, and the fungus grows down further in the root and makes a new one. So it's a very dynamic structure more so than the ecto mycorrhizae were. They also can make little spores inside the plant root called vesicles. And that's what you're looking at here. This shows a, a scanning electron micrograph of, of a freeze fractured uh, root cells. And so you can see these little arbuscles sticking into the interior of the, of the plant root here. And then this is a, a, a diagram from an earlier, uh, much earlier French paper. So you can see we've known about these for, for many years. This is from uh, 1905. So you can see they can form various kinds of these little branch structures in roots. And sometimes they make coils instead. There's two different types of interactions. And this is a fossil from the Rhiney chert at the top of the Devonian. Uh, and it has an arbuscle in it. So these mycorrhizal fungi go back to the very earliest land plants. And there's good molecular evidence now that all plants uh, were initially associated with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. They have the genes that are necessary to interact with these. Uh, and the ones that are no longer arbuscular mycorrhizae have basically given up that ability. But, um, but initially, land plant colonization was probably facilitated by this mycorrhizal interaction. This is the way a root looks from the outside when it's colonized, not different from a normal root. The only way you can see that these things are in there is to clear and stain them and look at them under a microscope. Normal roots are colonized and, <laughs> and they don't look any different. So on the outside here, you can just see the fine hyphae that are going out into the soil. And you can see these great big spores that I'll come back to. So we just talked about the plants and the one, one thing I didn't mention was their dependency. In the ectos, I mentioned that uh, plants that are ectomycorrhizal are usually very dependent, that they actually have to have these fungi around to grow. In the case of our buscular mycorrhizal uh, interactions, plants uh, vary a lot in their dependency and sometimes uh, it's actually not good for them to be colonized even. Um, so I'll show you that next. This is a, a, a graph from uh, John Chloronymus, who studies AM fungi a lot. And what he's showing here is the interaction of different plants that are lined up on the y-axis here. 
uh, and their growth response uh, with one particular uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus. So this is showing uh, the middle line here would be the, how big the plant would get if it was not colonized at all. So you can see some plants, uh, they get much larger when they're colonized. And there's a whole gradation of those. And then some plants actually get smaller when they're colonized, that they grow less when they have this interaction. But that's one fungus. So what happens if we add more plants and more fungi? It gets messier. <laughs> so this is um, uh, what you're looking at here is um, uh, an array of different plants with uh, an array of different fungi here that that interact with them. So you can see that a single plant can be uh, can be stimulated by some fungi and and their growth depressed by others. So these are all mycorrhizal fungi, but the re, but the reaction with the plant can be different. And a single mycorrhizal fungus may be good for one plant, but bad for another. So it's it's quite hard to predict what what the outcome will be if you don't if you haven't uh, done that experiment with a particular plant, and so this is one of the reasons that it's quite hard to manage uh, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi in any way to uh, evoke a, a growth response on a plant of your choice. You have to actually spend some time figuring out okay which strain of this, and worse than that, you somehow have to figure out how to keep that one strain the only one around. Because, because it will change throughout the season because there's a lot of these in the soil, any soil. So it's complicated. It's much more complicated than the ectos. And I should mention that the arbuscular, arbuscular mycorrhizal plants can do the same thing that, the, that the, some of the ecto plants do is that they can cheat the system. So here is a, um, here, here's a tropical plant that, is, that lacks uh, photosynthesis. Uh, and sponges off an arbuscular mycorrhizal interaction, just like the monotropes did with the ectos. So we can, so we can get this um, uh, cheating of the system. Okay, how about cost? Well, the cost to the host in terms of arbuscular mycorrhizae seems to be less than for ectos. It doesn't, uh, the plants don't have to give as much of the, in the way of sugars, but they also get less from the from, from the fungi. Mostly they get phosphorus, they get uh, inorganic nitrogen, so nitrogen that they could retrieve with their roots themselves, and they'll get trace elements and, and so on. Uh, but what they're not getting is access to nutrients that, that their roots couldn't achieve. They just get a more efficient grab of these, and particularly with the phosphorus, the, the fungi are very good at, at getting the phosphorus out. The fungi involved in this case are the are one group, the glomeromycota. There's only about 240 species that are described, but there's almost no morphology associated with these. And so they're probably grossly underdescribed. And, and they're difficult to work with because they don't grow in culture at all. Um, there's some tricks now to get them to grow a little bit. But uh, essentially, these are obligately associated with plants. And so they're difficult to work with from that aspect. Um, so the inoculum that uh, for arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, again, what would cause uh, uninfected roots to become infected by them uh, is basically the same as with ectos. It's that mycelium from one root to another is still the most common um, way for this to occur. Um, Colonized root fragments can be another that uh, they make these spores inside the roots. So as the roots turn over, they, they can germinate and, and colonize other roots. Uh, and then they also have these huge multinucleate spores. Uh, these things are very lipid rich. And so lots of little critters like to eat them. So they turn over in the soil fairly rapidly. Um, there's some dormancy with these, but generally the spores only last for a year or two. And so uh, this might come back to the question about, you know, what situation would you not have inoculum in? 
One of the common situations where you would not have arbuscular mycorrhizal inoculum is just a fallow field, a field that has not grown anything for some period of time. And that uh, fallowness will, will cause the spores to turn over uh, because things will eat them and they'll, and they'll die uh, and they're not getting new ones generated. This is the way the spores look. The little bar is 100 microns, so a, a, a tenth of a millimeter. So uh, you probably look at these and go, wow, those are small. These are big. <laughs> For on a, fungal, on a fungal scale, these are big spores. Uh, and some of them can be really big. They can, they can be up to a half a millimeter, so five, 500 uh, microns. Um, but you can fish these out of soil. Um, in in various ways and find them and when people first found them they didn't they were so atypically large that they didn't recognize them as fungal spores they were initially initially described as uh, nematode eggs <laughs> okay and i'll stop here and are there questions on our vascular Can our buscular mycorrhizae borrow from uh, EM to get nutrients? Wow, that's a cool question. I, and the answer is, I have no idea. I've never heard of that. <laughs> might be possible. Uh, it might, uh, and it could easily go both ways on that. Uh, ectos might do it as well. Uh, okay, I'll skip that. What happens to fungi in very dry soils? How do droughts affect fungi? So fungi don't like droughts much. Um, and so most of the fungal biomass when the soil dries up dies. And so they have to go to some resistant structure uh, like those spores. Uh, and if the drought doesn't last forever, um, then when it wets up again, the spores would germinate and you'd, you'd go back to having fungi again. Uh, or if there were little wet pockets in them, they'd survive and then grow out from them. But, but they are not very drought tolerant. Are they adversely affected by fertilizer? Yes. So if if you uh, fertilize heavily, you probably are selecting against them because a lot of plants can can be facultative. They don't need them per se. When you give them a lot of uh, uh, fertilizer, you probably suppress the the mycorrhizae to some extent. And we've certainly seen this in our crop plants. Like, but I think that's happened through breeding over the years. Is that we've We've sort of selected for our crop plants to respond to fertilizers, and part of that response is not being mycorrhizal. So, so plants that whose ancestors probably were very mycorrhizal dependent are now not very mycorrhizal dependent because we we've selected against it over over time. Um, please go over the differences uh, of the different types of mycorrhizae. To, uh, as a synopsis, I can I can come back to that at the end. <laughs> Let's see anything else. Okay, that was an extra question. All right, let's go back. Um, right. All right, so let's talk about ericoid mycorrhizae. So the ericoid mycorrhizae are really different in that they're limited to one plant family, uh, the plant family being the blueberry family, the ericaceae. Um, these, the plants here typically require these. Um, and the fungi involved are, are different. These are fungi involved are mostly ascomycota in one particular group. Um, but there are some basidial mycota that also are involved with the ericoid mycorrhizae, but we don't quite understand what they're doing very well yet. Um, but a more limited group of fungi, and this group, the uh, ascomycete ones, actually have some ability to live without the host. So this is the first mycorrhizal group that we've talked about where the fungi maybe have some life uh, without the plants as well. They're similar to the 
to the ectomycorrhizal uh, association in that they can they can break down litter and and uh, obtain organic nitrogen. And so you see these again in settings where a lot of the nutrients are tied up in litter. The morphology is found only on what's called the hair roots of, of the blueberry family. And the arrows here are pointing to the outside cell on here, which, which has these little coils of hyphae in it. And these are very short-lived structures that last a week or two and then turn over. And this shows uh, a hypha of a fungus just penetrating before it made the coil. And then these dense blobs here are stained for the fungus. So you can see they're, they've got big wads of fungus in a single cell. Um, so it's a slightly different look. Again, it's one of these that if you pulled the roots up and looked at it, you couldn't tell it was colonized. You'd have to uh, clear them and stain them and look at them under a microscope to see it. But if you have a blueberry in nature, it's always going to have these. If you're growing blueberries in your uh, yard, if it came in a pot, it's probably colonized. Uh, and I don't think anybody starts these from seed. Um, so, so you probably have them with you. These, like the ectos, are mostly in the far north and a little uh, more in the south. It doesn't show it here, but it, the Pacredaceous heathland here in uh, Australia would also have these. But mostly we think of them as being a boreal forest uh, and high altitude sort of thing where, again, where the nutrients are tied up because the, the degradation rate is so slow there uh, that in order for plants to grow, they have to team up with these fungi to get their nutrients out of this. Um, the last type of mycorrhizae I want to mention are the orchid mycorrhizae. These are limited to one plant family, the orchidaceae, uh, and many orchids require these to even germinate their seeds. So the orchid seed won't germinate until it sees a uh, a compatible fungus. And it does that because orchid seeds are tiny. They come with almost no reserves uh, and they come with an undifferentiated embryo. So when, when the fungus associates with it, uh, it starts to get carbon from that fungus from day one uh, and it allows it to uh, start to develop. The fungi in this case are, are a hodgepodge of oddball things, uh, including fungi that are sometimes uh, parasites like Rhizoctonia, uh, or some ectomycorrhizal fungi can, can form with orchids. Um, some saprobes like the honey mushroom, Armillaria, can, can form with some orchids. So, so the orchids have, have done um, some amazing things with picking up new fungal associates. And the other amazing thing is that what they get from the fungi is everything, that usually the plant delivers the carbon, but in the case of orchid mycorrhizae, the fungi, the fungi give the plant carbon. Uh, so somehow orchids have faked fungi out, basically. They're sort of, there's the, just like they fake out many of their pollinators and give them no reward, they also fake out their, the mutualistic fungi and often give them no reward. Uh, and uh, if you're not already fascinated with, with orchids, this is one more reason to be fascinated by orchids. <laughs> they faked out the fungi. Um, this is the way an orchid mycorrhizal interaction looks. Whoops, where did I lose them? Ah. So this is a, an orchid root here. And these little dark things are cells that are loaded with fungal hyphae. And if we blow one of those up here, you can just see these coils of fungal hyphae in there. What happens is that the fungus penetrates the cell, makes this coil, and then the plant digests it. The coil <laughs> disappears over time as the plant digests it. Uh, so the fungus apparently thinks it's found something cool and is doing doing some interaction with it, but in the end, the, the orchid uh, fakes it out and uh, gets everything from it. 
Okay, so that's the last mycorrhizal group. And I'll just go through the what I think are the take home messages from, from this talk is that first, almost all plants are mycorrhizal. That you, you know, it's, it's easier to name the ones that aren't. Basically the brassicaceae, the mustard family is rarely mycorrhizal. The kenopods are, are rarely mycorrhizal. Um, and some desert plants, I think cacti and so on are rarely mycorrhizal but almost everything else is mycorrhizal. So if you, if you are looking at a plant in nature, chances are high that it's mycorrhizal. There's these four main types of mycorrhizae. I've talked, talked about the ectos, with their, which are with big temperate trees, the am, which are with, our, which, which are with everything else almost, the aracoid that are only with the blueberries and the orchid mycorrhizae that are only with the orchids. Um, and each of those is, is slightly different. Uh, plant species vary dramatically with their dependencies. Remember the ectos, highly dependent. AM, AM plants usually quite variable. And remember that in the AM plants, the outcome plus or minus with the association of a given fungus can vary. One fungus can be good for one plant, bad for another. Specificity exists on, on both plant and fungal sides. I didn't really mention it on the fungal side, but there are some fungi that are, that are very specific to particular plants. But generally, plants are associated with lots of different fungi. That a, a single plant would have many different ectomycorrhizae associated with it if it's an ectomycorrhizal plant, or it would have many different AM uh, mycorrhizal fungi if it's an AM plant. Uh, and the highest specificity we see are with these mycorrhizal parasites only. Okay, so at that point, I will stop and I will try to answer whatever questions remain here. And I, and I realize I skipped through them as I was looking, looking along. So if there's other ones, uh, I can do that. Tom, maybe I could identify a couple. Uh, sure. One, one question is, any idea why 5% of the plants are not mycorrhizal? So mostly the plants that are not mycorrhizal are very, very weedy plants. They're things that show up in highly disturbed settings where possibly mycorrhizal fungi would not be present and, and where nutrients are, are kind of loose and easy to find. Um, and the other... Uh, the other one that I forgot to mention is non-mycorrhizal are the, um, uh, not podocarp, let's see, uh, what's Banksia in? Uh, uh, um, the Southern Hemisphere in South Africa and Australia, uh, they make cluster roots in their non-mycorrhizal. Um, Proteaceae, the pr Proteaceae are, are non-mycorrhizal and they have, come up with a different way of getting phosphorus by having these cluster roots that exude lots of uh, phosphatases. And another set of questions has to do with inoculants. Uh, what, you know, what, what about use of mycorrhizae in a nursery uh, for plants in your garden? Kind of the whole, whole question of can you, can you help nature along in this so, area? I think this has been the holy grail of uh, mycorrhizal research since the early days is to try to try to use it to to um, produce you know better growing plants or healthier plants um, and avoid fertilizers. And I, I think the main problem is that usually there's plenty of inoculum around without adding it. So adding inoculum rarely is necessary to get things to be mycorrhizal. And when you add a specific species, it's competing with all the ones that are already there. And so it's often difficult to get that one species to become a dominant thing in that setting and, and cause whatever effect you were after. Um, and, and so, there's, there's been relatively limited success, I would say, on, on using mycorrhizal inoculum. So in forestry, it's been a little more common. Uh, 
um, because in nursery settings in forestry, oftentimes things aren't mycorrhizal. But usually when you outplant pine seedlings into what was a forest after a clear cut or a fire or whatever, there's so much inoculum out there that they become mycorrhizal almost immediately. So um, it hasn't, uh, I can't think of any really great success stories. The, the biggest success may have been in selling uh, inoculum. Uh, there's lots of companies that do it. Uh, but I, th I think that uh, um, th there's usually not good evidence that it has much of an effect. Another question has to do with, uh, in, in the field, can you identify these species or do you need to take them back to the, uh, to the lab? Could you, could, could, would it be possible to put together a field guide for these, for example? So for the ectomycorrhizal species that fruit and make big mushrooms and so on, yes, you can identify those. From the, from the root tip level, um, looking at just sort of branching pattern and color and whatnot uh, and microscopic features of it, um, there was a lot of effort to try to identify them that way uh, uh, for years. And, and there was some success with that. Uh, and then the molecular identification methods came along and they were so much simpler and faster and higher throughput that uh, I think everybody's given up on trying to identify them morphologically because uh, you could spend, you know, an hour on one tip and come up with a maybe. Uh, and in the same time, you could, you could uh, go through a whole field plot of, you know, 60 samples and grind them up and, and put them in the sequencer and, the day, the next day, or the day after that, you'd have all the answers. So, um, the molecular uh, identification approach has sort of taken over here. Uh, on the AM side, uh, the quick answer is no. You could never identify them in the field. Um, you could identify their spores if you've been learning how to do that for uh, years. <laughs> um, but, um, but again, the uh, molecular method for identification is kind of uh, supplanted that now, and it's the main way that people identify these. And uh, I guess one question is, do, do these fun, fungi compete among themselves? And... Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is, this is one of the problem with mycorrhizal inoculum is that uh, let's say that you find an ectomycorrhizal fungus that's going to make your pine trees grow twice as fast, and you put it on all of your seedlings and put them out in the field. You come back the next year, you can't even find it because, because all the other fungi that were out there about competed it. Uh, so the, the competition below ground is ferocious in in my mind. There's the, you know things things turn over very quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's sort of a musical chairs game every, uh, every season as the roots die off at the end of the season and then, and then new ones come up in the spring, um, uh, and fungi are moving from one to another and trying to retain a chair. Um, but, uh, uh, there's certainly, uh, successional trends in this community and there's good evidence from inoculation experiments that, that things get outcompeted pretty quickly. Um, so I would say anything you learned about community ecology and plants, the general things like competition and, and succession and so on, it's going to have parallels uh, below ground with uh, mycorrhizal fungi as well. Is, the question is, is there a relationship between mycorrhizae and humic acid? Ooh, don't know. I'm, I'm kind of a lousy soil scientist. And so I think if I had to describe in any kind of detail what humic acid is, I would fail that test. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, what the re interaction with fungi and it would be. 
what question I guess has to do with evolution. What what's the purpose of all these spores if they're so seldom successful? Ah, um, <clears throat> well, I think. Uh, they ultimately are successful, that all of these things move around by spore. They, it's just that the, the probability that, that any one of them will work in a particular setting is, is vanishingly low. And so in order to win that competition, they have to produce a lot of them. Um, it's sort of like, you know, if you want to win the lottery, you better buy a lot of tickets. <laughs> You'll probably still lose. But, <laughs> but um but if that's the only game in town, you better be buying those tickets. And so I think that's what's going on with these fungi is that, uh, yes, it's inefficient. And that's why they produce these amazingly big fruit bodies and produce, you know, trillions of spores. Um, Here's a question that asks you to be a movie reviewer. What do you think of the fantastic fungi documentary? I shamefully i've never watched it i've heard a lot of good things about it but i thought okay i'm not going to learn anything from this <laughs> so, I, so and, and that's probably a, a bad attitude i should probably i should probably go and, and watch i've heard that the visually it's it's stunningly beautiful and uh but uh i have no um direct experience with it and here, here's a question whether mycorrhizae have anything to do with water uptake as opposed to, to nutrient uptake yes so i so i was emphasizing the nutrients but they do a number of other things they, they certainly do water they pick up water they also they also can get water from their host that some uh like up in drier soil sometimes the the host will deliver water to the fungus um but uh they can also absorb water and pass it on to their host too and they and they also have an interaction with uh, di, uh, facilitating disease resistance in the in the plant, as well. That um, if you don't have a good mycorrhizal colonization of the plant, they're more susceptible to a lot of little root diseases and and uh, some important ones actually. A couple of questions about how we can use this information. For example, uh, how can we use it? Uh, to create a healthier home garden or to participate in uh, uh, policy issues about wildland restoration or uh, uh, maintenance, conservation? Uh, are, there, are there takeaways that we as conservationists can, uh, can use? Well, I think, I think one of the takeaways is that you usually don't have to worry about the mycorrhizae. That they are going to they're going to form under most circumstances that it's only when things are really brutally disturbed uh you know even even beyond sort of the brutality of of clear-cut logging and so on um that you really have to worry about them that normally um you're going to have inoculum in the soil uh and then in terms of controlling it, as I mentioned earlier, that's been a goal of, uh, of sort of applied end of mycorrhizae forever, uh, but it's been an elusive goal. It's, it's, it's uh, very difficult to, to sort of hold a mycorrhizal community with the species you want there and exclude the others. Uh, question about, um, nodule forming uh nitrogen the 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 p the p family and so forth and how do how do they relate to these the, those you've been talking about um so that's a bacterial interaction that's uh that's brady rhizobium and rhizobium uh that that goes in and fixes nitrogen they actually take atmospheric nitrogen and and make it into organic nitrogen and pass it onto the plant in these little nodules but they do relate to mycorrhizae in one important way. And that's that the, uh, the signaling pathway that they use to interact with the plant is co-opted from the arbuscular mycorrhizal signaling pathway. So they, uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae came earlier, right? They came 
right when when land plants colonized uh, in the Devonian, uh, and the nodulating uh, bacteria for legumes and so on didn't show up until early Cretaceous or maybe late Jurassic or something like that. So so hundreds of thousands of years later, or hundreds of millions of years later. Um, and when they showed up, they basically co-opted this, this signaling pathway that the arbuscular mycorrhizae already uh, were using with plants. So they do interact in that way. And a lot of the plant, I think all of the plants that form nodules are also arbuscular mycorrhizal. Uh, so, they, so they have like a dual uh, or a three-part interaction going on. Another question about the relationship between uh, mycorrhiza research and no-till agriculture. Was, was, was that research the basis, one of the bases for no-till agriculture? I think it was probably one of the motivations for it. It was the idea that, that it might maintain the mycorrhizal networks better. Um, but uh, um, I think it's just one piece of that whole picture. I mean, for, for example, is, is there research from agri agricultural research that, that shows that the uh, uh, tilling, annual tilling and, and harrowing, et cetera, destroys mycorrhiza? It certainly breaks up these networks. Uh, and, it, and then, and then the, uh, having the field fallow for that period will also sort of erode the, the spore bank. Uh, as well, so the inoculum is going to drop in fields that are that are plowed and here, but it won't drop to zero unless you're growing a non-mycorrhizal crop, and then it will drop drop to zero. Rapeseed or something, you, you have a field of rapeseed, you've destroyed your mycorrhizal community uh, after a couple seasons of that. Uh. What about what about communications? One of the uh, there's been a literature out there about plants communicating with each other and sending signals about insect uh, attacks and so forth. And what's the role of mycorrhizae in, in, in those communication networks? So <clears throat> the idea here is that uh, plants are connected to each other through these mycorrhizal networks. That is, if plant A is associated with fungus number number one and fungus number one is also connected to plant B, that there's this connection then between the plants through the fungus. And uh, those mycorrhizal cheaters that I mentioned would be a good example of this, uh, where one plant has, has used that network to sponge off another plant. Um, but uh, people have also found that the that some signaling can go through through here, like some of the uh, plant signals, like jasmonic acid, and and I'm trying to remember the other common ones. But um, some of the some of the signals that plants let off when they are attacked by insects or attacked by a pathogen uh, are chemical signals, and those chemi chemicals can move along a, a fungal network um, as well as going through the plant. And so there's there's some evidence that the plants um, basically talk to each other through their mycorrhizal networks. And finally, a question is: Are mycorrhizae farmed, or would there be any reason to farm them? Ah, <laughs> yes. I mean, some are highly edible, right? So, like that Boletus edulis, for example. Uh, a lot of work has been put into trying to grow Boletus edulis um, without. A great deal of success, uh, but if if there was success, it would be worth a lot of money. That's that's a high value crop. Uh, the highest value mycorrhizal crop are true truffles. Um, the truffle of commerce now, um, at least uh, the black truffles, uh, are grown in orchard settings where they're inoculated onto either hazel or oak roots. And then uh, the ground around them is managed to encourage them. And this is, uh, 
kind of the interface between science and witchcraft in getting this to work. But when it works well, it's like harvesting gold nuggets out of the ground because they're they're so valuable. Uh, in California, actually, there, there's a number of people in California that have brought in the um, Paragor truffle here and have successfully produced it. And it's also occurred now in New Zealand, in Australia, uh, and especially those Southern Hemisphere sites where they're out of cycle with the European um, harvest time, uh, they're producing a very high value value crop as a result. So, so I would say that 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 the food side of ectomycorrhizal production has been the biggest su success story for for managing mycorrhizae. Is that the truffles in particular? have been uh, a big win. But uh, a lot of the other edible mushrooms have not been successfully grown that way yet. Uh, and there's a number of high value ones, Matsutake, uh, Bolita sedulis, chanterelles, uh, all of these end up in our markets, but they're collected. Uh, they aren't grown. Yeah. We have a few minutes. Uh, if anybody has an additional question and would like to raise their electronic hand, I'll unmute you. I don't see any additional questions. No blue hands. Well, in, in, in that case, I, I, I want to thank you. That's a fascinating, fascinating discussion of, a, of an area that we native plant people need to know a lot more about. And uh, really thank you for your, your, your talk. Uh, before we go, I, I want to uh, let you know about this, remind you about the spring online plant sale. We, we not, we're not having live plant sales for obvious reasons, but we've had a very robust uh, couple of plant sales and one is coming up this month. In fact, next week, starting next Wednesday on the 17th, running for a week. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, getting some native plants in the ground while they still rain. And I just heard some uh, uh, about a minute ago coming down on my skylight, which is a delightful experience. Uh, so you might wanna check out the, uh, the, uh, the website. Uh, I don't know exactly when the plant list will be up there, but uh, it, 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 it may not be until the 17th. Uh, but in any case, I think there's a good selection of plants and I encourage you to, uh, to check it out. So again, Tom, thanks so much, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, seeing you next month. Thanks okay. again. Yeah, maybe in the flesh next year. <laughs> <laughs> yes.